welcome back. We're continuing the story here to, to uh, find out from your history, from, you, from your firsthand experience, what happened in this, in this situation. You were at the point where you were restraining your wife mm -hmm. and she had been drinking and she was becoming, she had become violent and your Marine Corps training uh, was kicking in. You're just simply not being violent, matching violence with violence, but instead you're trying to re uh, just simply defend yourself, restrain her, hopefully bring calm and order to the situation. Mm -hmm. Was it working? It, well, at first I thought it was. After I held her down, first she was you know, physically violent at first, and, um, I, but then she stopped. And when she started to calm down, you know, I talked to her calmly, you know, here's what is going on. I'm not trying to hurt you. I held you down because, you know, you can't hit me with a chair. <laughs> you can't swing at me. That's not, you know, something that is going to happen in this house. It's just not. And, uh, and I said, you know, I'm going to call your friend and ask her to stay with you tonight. Then I told her what I was going to do. You know, I'm trying to calm the situation as I'm, you know, holding her down. I said, you know, basically that's what I'm going to do. You still needed the password to do that. Right, right. Well, at this, I, I know I needed the password, but I was trying to... Uh, rationalize with her mm -hmm. say this is what I'm trying to do is I want you to have a trusted friend come stay with you you can talk to you know you can uh, tell her how you feel about the situation and get it out and but it's something that we obviously need to be distanced from this because it's when it gets to the point of physical violence we're not having a discussion anymore this isn't a husband and wife healthy relationship mm -hmm. you know this is a violent relationship mm -hmm. and and so I basically explained that and I could see her you know the breathing slowing down you know she was showing indications that she was calming down um, I released her at that point, and she got up and went, stormed out to the living room, and a little bit later she called the police from that point. Did you know that she was on the phone with the police? It took me a minute. She I heard her kind of talking in the living room. I was all the way back in the bedroom, and I was actually back on the computer trying to find a way around the block she had done. And um, in the meantime, she's, uh, she's calling 911. In the meantime, she's calling 911. And she reported She what? reported that I had, she was angry, and she reported that I had assaulted her and committed domestic violence. And her, in which she explained at trial, she talked a lot about this, but she explained how it was, you know, she was angry and I wasn't validating her feelings. And she had tried physically, she had tried everything she could, and she couldn't get to me. I was still the calm, you know, exterior that I usually have. And because she couldn't kind of, you know, get in there and, you know, feel like I was hurting like she was, it was her next instinct was, I'm going to reach out and try to get someone else to cause him pain because I'm not able to myself. Hmm. And in her current state with the alcohol and probably the, the mix of the prescription medication she had, um, it, it may have made it seem like a more good idea, even though something that you normally, rationally, you would say this isn't, this isn't a good idea. You may, you've heard the 911 tapes, I assume. I have. Did it sound like she was slurring her words or having other obvious symptoms that would indicate that she had been drinking? She didn't sound much like she's slurring her words, but she, uh, usually the way I can tell if my wife's been drinking is she gets more emotional. And you can definitely hear that in the tape. That's kind of how she acts if she has been. She doesn't drink a lot typically, but if she does, if she even has a couple of drinks, I can tell she becomes more emotional as a person. And she was definitely emotional on the uh, tape. And she actually told them that I had hit them, had hit her in the front of the face and the back of the head multiple times in hard is what she said. Hard in the front, hard in the back. Um, which, which actually that was, I'm glad she mentioned that because it actually benefited me later when they could see that, you know, you have a Marine that outweighs her by over 80 pounds and there's not a single mark, not a scratch, not a bruise, not a red spot, nothing anywhere. And it just didn't make sense. So when you, when did you discover that she was on the phone with 911? Did you walk in on that conversation? I did. I walked out because I thought maybe, I realized, I said, oh, wait, she has a phone. <laughs> and that's what at first when I heard her on the phone, I was thinking, I can just grab her phone. It hadn't occurred to me at the time, but I was thinking her best friend's number is going to be in her phone. So I can simply pick up her phone and use it. And I heard her on the phone. So I, as I started walking down out of the living room, uh, I heard her and I noticed that she was on. With the way she was talking, I could tell she was on, obviously. It seemed like this is a 911 call. This is a, you know, she's... Uh, reporting me for something. And what was your reaction to that? At that point, I realized that when she had done that, it was best that I just stay away from her. And uh, I knew at that point I was going to have to wait for the police to come if that was the case. So I kind of said, you know, what are you doing? You know, at first I said, are you telling them that you hit me? That you're calling on yourself? And uh, she's, you know, I think she said it, uh, that she admitted that she had slapped me or something like that. And then I just turned around and said, no, I'm just going to walk away because, you know, that's um, so you didn't hang up the phone, you didn't nope. try to say, hey, my wife, grab the phone or anything like that, you just let her talk. She so she finished off the 911 call. She finished the call, and I actually, at that point, even mid-call, so this is mid-call, I turned around and walked back to the bedroom and said, I'm just going to wait. Now, obviously, the police are coming, and I'm just going to stay here and wait for them to, to come. 
So she completed the call, and I think at this point, finally she had gotten, at least felt like she had gotten it off her chest or something. She had come back to the room to talk to me afterwards, and she was much more calm than she was prior to the 911 call. And uh, so that's what it took to calm her down, strangely, but that's what it took. At that point, she walked in, and she had the knowledge that police were on the way. Right. And they, I assume at this point, are ex I expect for domestic violence, the, the natural reaction or expectation is the husband is a, the stronger, more muscular husband is attacking the wife, and that's mm -hmm. what she had reported. So when the police came to the door, what happened? Well, initially, she had calmed down by the time they got there quite a bit. And uh, they probably came, I think, 20 minutes or so after the call. But she uh, went to the door, and something that we've always talked about before is not to, uh, she had an experience prior to this where she was pulled over on the highway years ago when she was in college. And the police had actually said she had a suspicious looking vehicle, pulled her out of her car in the rain, had her stand on the side of the road while they searched her car. So she had a bad experience. Yes. So that was playing into this? Yes, and I told her before that, you know, you don't have to do that. You know, you have Fourth Amendment rights, and, you know, while most police officers are good, upstanding people, you know, they, you don't have to allow them to search, you don't have to allow them. If they ever do that again, your response is, I'm sorry, I have a Fourth Amendment right, you know, unless you have some cause <laughs> better than I have a suspicious-looking VW Jetta, <laughs> you know, it's mm -hmm. not, you're not searching my vehicle. What does that Fourth Amendment say? It specifically says that, well, one of the elements of the Fourth Amendment is that, you know, you have, they have to have a warrant, they have to have probable cause, they have to have, it has to be based, they have to have, you know, they have to go to a judge essentially, get a, obtain a warrant stating where a judge looks at it and says you have probable cause to search this, citing specifically the things, you know, to be searched, the places to be searched, and the things to be seized. That's what the Fourth Amendment says. So, so it protects from uh, unlawful search and, and seizure. Absolutely. Or, uh, this, oh, what's the word? <laughs> yeah, it does. It, mm -hmm. uh, unlawful search and seizure. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it, it is something our founding fathers knew because but prior to the United States coming into existence, of course, mm -hmm. you know, the official came and they did whatever they wanted. They rifled through your papers. They searched your home. They, and our founders knew that that, you know, that isn't the right way we should be proceeding. That sure. citizens should be in charge of their government, not government in charge of their citizens. So all that extra baggage adds a little bit mm -hmm. more. So when she opened the door and police were there, uh, how did that play into this? Well, she told them to wait outside. She said that, you know, I don't want you inside the house. I'll talk to you outside. Because we had discussed how they don't come inside the house. They don't come inside your car. You can talk to them. You control the situation. They're not dictating to you. You're, you know, in control. And uh, so she had told them to stay on the, the front door, and she would talk. You have At a that, front porch, I take it. We do have they're a front not, porch. They're not they're out not in the out rain. rain. It was a nice night. Yeah, it was um, a little bit wet, but it was, yeah, they're covered. It wasn't a bad situation to be in. Um, I actually walked to the front of the house at that point, too. They pushed her out of the way, came inside the house, and I told them the same thing. I said, I'll be happy to talk to you guys, but let's talk on the front porch. We want you out of the house. Uh, they ignored me, so I said, okay, we have a Fourth Amendment. <laughs> and I began discussing the Fourth Amendment. And, uh, and they essentially ignored me anyway, searched me, told me that it was for my own safety that they were coming inside my house and searching me. And, uh, and then after they had completed their search, they took me outside and stayed, one of the police officers stayed with my wife, the actual deputy sheriff. So they searched you for weapons? Inside. They just searched me for weapons. Okay. They didn't search her. And you felt like at that point, it sounds like your, your constitutional rights were, being, rights were being violated. Absolutely. Did that upset you? It did. It did. And I knew that that's something I would deal with later. And I told them, you know, this is, you know, I didn't act, you know, aggressive about it, but I let them know that I understand that my rights are being violated. They said under community caretaking laws, that they were allowed to go inside a home. Mm -hmm. Well, those people that, if you know the history of community caretaking, it initially happened because there was a police officer that showed up at someone's house, and the door was ajar, and it was an elderly woman who lived alone, and they were worried about her health and safety. So they were saying, well, we don't want to have to get a warrant to go in to help the elderly woman that we know is inside this home, that you know, she could be hurt. So the judges in the past have said, okay, well, that's okay. In that situation, you can go in to try to help them because you have a reason to you know, try to protect your community and it's not something you're doing sure. to be malicious. So the police officers, they have to make a call. They have to make they a have, call. They, they have to decide what they're going to do in this situation because the call they received that, that this woman was in distress, she's being attacked, and they needed to be able to step in and Right. Help. But the situation here was different. And it was different because both of us were at the front door, both clearly not injured, both clearly saying, step outside and we'll have a discussion with you. So they, it, it creates a different scenario. So they had violated the Fourth Amendment, and I made them known that I understood my Fourth Amendment rights, and I knew that they had violated it. And uh, at that point, the deputy talked to my wife and the two Camas police officers. Who, there were three total cops. Uh, deputy was inside with my wife. The Camas cops were outside. And I talked to the Camas cops for a little bit. They tried doing the cop routine 
with me, um, which is typical where they try to get you know information and, and do the cop thing, and I explain to them, you know, I have Fifth Amendment right as well, and my Fifth Amendment right is to remain silent, and and the reason I'm remaining silent is I basically told him, I said, look guys, you know, I don't dislike you. My dad was a cop, so I know exactly what you're doing. I grew up in a cop house. <laughs> we went to the POB lodge, you know, every other weekend at Pig Roast with all the other cops. Um, this is the environment I grew up in. I know exactly what you're doing and how you're doing it. I said, but here's the situation. You know, I have a Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. I am a public figure. If I say anything, it goes in your police report. Your police report tomorrow will be in the paper. <laughs> so I, at this point in time, you know, because I don't, you know, I, I want to, uh, essentially I didn't want to, uh, say what my wife had done publicly, and I was hoping that all of that wouldn't have to come out. And I didn't want to, of course, as a husband, I don't want to embarrass her, and I don't want to have to, you know, talk about these kind of things. Um, so I said, I'm, because, you know, of that, I'm ex exercising my Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. Were you still running for Congress at that point, or was this no, after that? This was after that, but I knew that obviously, you know, I'm, I'm going to work in politics in some capacity just because, you know, this is what I, you know, I, I love. I'm, I'm passionate about the Constitution. I'm passionate about none of those things during the campaign were fake. Like, those are my actual beliefs. So, and it's not something that I'm going to stop doing in some capacity. And I understood that, you know, if, you know, it, it can be uh, not just on me, but because I'm going to be in the public eye, you know, that kind of thing about my wife would become news and that would be broadcast. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't feel like her friends and coworkers and everyone else you know, needed to have every detail of a household argument. So you still have to have, it's difficult to balance privacy mm -hmm. and still run for a public office or have a future where you're interested in running for a public office. So the officers at this point, it doesn't, I wouldn't expect that they're going to be very favorable to you at this point. They still have to make calls. They're still thinking this woman's being attacked. All they know is what they've said to her. You're being silent and you're basically standing up for your rights at this mm -hmm. point. So what do they do? Well, the deputy initially, arre he arrested me, and he said that the reason he was arresting me is because I asserted my Fifth Amendment rights, and he thought this made me suspicious. Well, you can't arrest people in this country for asserting their rights. That's not something you can do. And he actually, we did a, uh, dep we deposed him later. My attorney actually did an interview with him, and he essentially said the same thing, is that he admitted that he didn't like the fact that I asserted my rights. Citizens don't know their rights, according to him, and that made me very suspicious. For those people that don't know what deposed means, Right. Well, we asked him uh, to come in and to have an uh, interview on the record, a recorded interview with both my attorney and the prosecutor. And, where, and at that interview, he admitted that that was the initial arrest was based on the fact that I asserted my Fifth Amendment rights and he thought that made me suspicious and he didn't like that. So. And do they have the, the, the I assume police officers need to make, make a call. They're constantly making decisions. Mm -hmm. What should I do in this situation? The a, a, after that, after they arrested you, uh, did they feel like, oh, you know, we shouldn't have done, done that? That was really the wrong call, well, or was that just the best call at the time that they could? You, you, it's always incomplete information. Mm -hmm. Well, I found out later a little bit more information they kind of gave me. Uh, the Camus cops, I think they were kind of looking at each other. Just the vibe I got was kind of they were thinking, well, this is kind of, you know, a strange case because he obviously is the calm one. He didn't attack anyone. There's no marks. I think they were kind of running it through their minds, just looking at them uh, and noticing the looks they were giving each other. It was kind of like, this guy obviously isn't doing anything wrong. He probably didn't. This is while and, you're at the police station? No, this is why we're still at the house. I'll see. I so see. he had initially placed me under arrest, took me to his car, and uh, he basically asked me, you know, what's happened. And I, what I decided was the deputy did. I gave him, I said, well, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I said, you know, I'm going to basically give you a, a little bit of information and I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but now that I'm being arrested, obviously this is now public. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not keeping any of these details private at this point um, so that, you know, protecting my wife's reputation essentially has been taken out of my hands. There's nothing I can do. And uh, so I said, you know, I'm going to go over, the, I gave him a few details and I said, if he doesn't do the right thing with these details and release me, then at that point, there's no hope. I, I mean, I could talk to the guy all night and it's not going to matter. So I basically explained to him quickly that, you know, look, she had too much to drink. She got angry. She attacked me and tried to hit me with a chair. I restrained her. And that's the extent of it. That's the extent of what happened. She called 911. And so he said, okay, wait here. He wa I waited outside. He went back in and talked to my wife. Um, essentially at this point, she had initially ch already started changing her story and trying to tone down what had actually happened, realizing, of course, the physical evidence didn't match. Nothing matched. And, uh, but at this point, she had told him, she said, look, here's what, he, he's right. This is what happened. She showed him the chair she had swung. She said, I attacked him. He didn't do anything. 
um, all he did was restrain me, and I was angry at him, and I made the whole thing up. Do you feel like she didn't did not expect you to get arrested? She and that was surprising to her. I think it was shocking. I think she and she told me this later. She thought they would come and they would basically yell at me. I, in her current state, <laughs> she was thinking that they would come and somehow lecture me about being mean to her, and they would leave.